Welcome into Ion Northeast Kansas, the podcast. I'm your host, Melissa Bruner. This is where we recap some of the top interview guests you saw on Ion Northeast Kansas, the TV show. You can catch it live streaming 4 o'clock p.m. Central Time, Monday through Friday on WIBW.com. It is election season already in Kansas, which for some of you, if you're from another state, you might be saying, uh, yeah, we know that. Well, Kansas hasn't had a presidential preference primary in several decades, so our elections officials both local and state have been reminding people that elections are coming around a little bit sooner this year. The Assistant Elections Commissioner for Shawnee County, Jake Fisher, visited Ion Northeast Kansas to let us know what that means in our area. Welcome to you. Thank you very much for having me. We haven't had a presidential preference primary in a while. We've had the commissioner here. We've had the secretary of state here to tell us how this is kind of like kickstarting all of your work for the year. The calendar says that offices could have started Wednesday with advanced voting. So some places may have it already. But what is the schedule in Shawnee County? For Shawnee County, we start on Monday, March the 4th. We start at 8 a.m. and go to 7 p.m. And that is for the next two weeks. So that'll be the week of the, uh, the 4th and the week of the 11th. And then the last day you can vote early is March 18th at 8 a.m. And we have to stop at noon by state law. Okay, so what do people need to make sure they've taken care of if they're going to go participate in this? At this point, they need to have registered to vote. The registration deadline has passed. And so at this point, if somebody is a registered Republican or Democrat, they would show up, they would vote. If somebody is an independent, they can also show up and choose to affiliate with a party and pick one of the ballots that day. So those two things are pretty important. If you've already declared with a party, you can't change it at Correct. this point. It has to be what you're registered as. But if you're unaffiliated, you can declare at the poll. That is correct, because an unaffiliated voter essentially is just a registered voter that has not chosen to join a party. And so if you want to participate and you are an unaffiliated voter, you would need to affiliate with a party or essentially join the party that day. Okay, we want to make sure it all flows smoothly. That's the next part of this. How do you do that? What processes are in place to make sure the process goes well, but then also that all of your machines actually work? Well, part of what we do with our machines is we do multiple tests on those machines, and we have one coming up here on March the 12th. That is our public test. Any members of the public are uh, welcome to come to that. That'll be at the elections office at 3420 Southwest Van Buren. We start at 9 a.m., and they can see how the machines are tested to make sure that they are tab uh, tabulating the votes correctly. How do you test them? In, in simple terms, what do you do to test What it? we have is we essentially have a test deck of ballots. We know what those ballots, how they're voted, and we run them through each machine that's going to be used on, on election day and make sure that the predetermined vote is correct. Is there any common issues that maybe would come up that are, you're able to take care of? You know, most of the time, if there is an issue, that machine is immediately tagged, pulled out of service, another machine is put in. And so it's, it's rare for that to happen, but they are... Uh, you know, machines. And sometimes there are glitches that happen when it comes to that testing. And so that's why we do so much testing is to ensure that those machines are working properly before they're sent out on election day. How are you doing on having enough workers for election day? Because there still is an actual official election day for those who choose not to vote early. They can go March 19th. That's correct. Right now we've already done uh, some uh, training for our election workers, but we're always looking for more folks that want to be involved in the process. If somebody wants to be involved, they can call our office at 7 885-251-5900 or they can go to our website and there's an application online that they can fill out and we still have more trainings available if somebody would like to participate in this upcoming election on the 19th. Any requirements for that because I have to tell you I was very impressed last fall for the municipal elections went to my precinct place there was a teenager there a young a young person who was 18 years old mm -hmm. um, was actually one of the poll workers which I thought was a fantastic way for a young person to get involved in the system. Well and absolutely we encourage students to do that and we've had high school students college students you need to be at least 16 years least 16, old okay. and then it's a great opportunity and I think it's a fabulous if you can get those young people involved now because I think then you're, you'll create a lifelong voter and you earn a few bucks yeah you do get a few I mean, bucks that's always a good thing too <laughs> absolutely <laughs> this this ballot's kind of simple because there's only one thing on it correct that is correct but if you still want to know first of all get a look at the ballot but then also you're not quite sure where to go you're not sure gosh am I affiliated with a party how do you do that you can go to our website there's a tab on there that you can check your registration if you click on that tab it'll send you to Kansas voter view and when you go to that you can just enter in your first name last name date of birth and then click on a sample ballot and it'll show you the sample ballot that you'd have and it'll also tell you where your uh, polling place is and, and if you want to go directly to it it's my voter view dot vote ks dot 
I have it written in here. <laughs> there it yes. is, myvoteinfo.votekos.org if you want to go directly to it. Or like Jake said, you can go to the Shawnee County Elections Office website and kind of click, you got the link from there, and that'll show you everything you need to know. So March 19th, if you want to vote yes. in person, is the actual election day. Advanced voting in Shawnee County starts Monday. And contact your local elections office if you're outside Shawnee County to know when you can do that. Appreciate you being here, Jake. Thank you very much for having me. Have the preference primary back. Here we go. Remember, myvoteinfo.votekos.org is where you can go anywhere to check your voter information. We also had another Jake in the studio this week. This one was Jake Henry. He is with Shawnee County Emergency Management. I was actually out of the studio for a little bit this week, a little bit of background. I was at some career fairs and also took a couple days off. So David Oliver, my co-anchor, filled in a little bit for me. And so Jake Henry joined David in the studio. The topic was Severe Weather Awareness Week. It is the week of March. Fourth, it is a time to remind ourselves of all our severe weather awareness planning that needs to be done now before those storms hit. David and Jake talked about that. He's here to talk about Severe Weather Preparedness Week, which is coming up next week. We do this every single year. Again, Jake, thanks for sticking around. We appreciate you being here. Um, despite, like I said earlier, the way it feels outside right now, it feels like winter once again, but we are on the cusp right now of severe weather season in Kansas, so we got to get prepared. Right. So uh, with severe weather season just around the corner, uh, we have severe weather preparedness week coming up. Uh, and there's a number of things that uh, folks need to be aware of. Uh, Monday night, we have the storm spotter class that's being held at Washburn University at 7 p.m. Uh, that's a great way to kind of get your yourself, your family into the mode of, of thinking about severe weather, uh, especially coming off of the strange weather that we just had. Yep. Um, and then uh, each day is given a, a specific focus uh, of, of weather threats or hazards uh, so that people can kind of think about the different hazards that exist. And then Wednesday, we have the tornado drill, uh, the statewide tornado drill at 11 a.m. And at that time, we're asking everybody participate uh, as they would in a real tornado. So go to the lowest level of your home or business, uh, put as many walls between you and the outdoors and that sort of thing. Yeah, obviously a lot to think about. And, and a lot of us have been through this, who grew up in Kansas, we know the drill, so to speak, but it's important to refresh our minds, think about those plans, fine tune those, those blueprints, if you will, in our own families to make sure we're ready. And now, especially too, with communication such as it is, where everything is at your fingertips, I have to imagine that's kind of changed how we may want to prepare in some ways. It is, uh, and Monday, Monday specifically, uh, the focus is just weather preparedness, mm -hmm. essentially. Um, and that day is a good day to focus on, you know, your weather radios, uh, making sure that you have notifications turned on on your cellular devices so that you could receive notifications. Um, there's a variety of different apps that you can sign up for, um, different weather services uh, to make sure that you receive notification if you're out and about. Uh, so it's a good time to really think about your, your family's plan. Yeah, and we talk about it very often here, our WIBW weather app that Jeremy and his team manage for us. We can get the notifications specific to where you are anywhere in the country. Uh, for that matter. So like you say, it's important to have those apps, get your notifications turned on. And, and again, this storm spotter training class coming up on Monday, this is really to help folks to understand what they're seeing out there and what they're hearing and how to report it in. Right. Yeah, it'll be an opportunity where folks can uh, become aware of what they're seeing, uh, signs of severe weather, uh, and also be aware of you know, the different tools that are available, such as weather radios and, and so on. So it's a good good opportunity for all of that. And, and just a final pitch, if you will, a reminder from, from your perspective in emergency management, because again, you know, a lot of us know we've been through this before and we think, well, I kind of know the ins and outs and I don't need to prepare, but really that's not the case. It's a good idea to refresh those skills. It is. It's one of those things that uh, sometimes people can become complacent, uh, you get kind of used to hearing the the, sh the pitch every year uh, living in in the region that we do um, and so it's it's important to to hit on those things every single year make sure that you have new batteries in your flashlights make sure that you have a plan and a kit and you know what to do so that if something happens you're ready to act you just never know when it's going to strike and in fact that storm spotter training class that we talked about is coming up on monday at seven o'clock over at washburn in the memorial union there in the washburn room 
uh, you can attend that. Also, don't forget next week that statewide tornado drill. You're going to hear the sirens at 11 a.m. next Wednesday, March 6th. I guess, uh, you know, pending any other weather that may come in. Normally, they don't want to do that if there's a cloudy day for, for obvious reasons. But again, that's coming up next week. And folks, when I post this interview with Jake on WIBW.com today, I'm going to post a link in there that's going to give you more information on other storm spotter training classes put on by the National Weather Service around Northeast Kansas so you can get information on a class where you live that's either in person or virtual. Jake, thank you very much for what you do to keep us safe and good luck next week. Thank you. All right. Good. And you can check the National Weather Service site, as they mentioned. There are storm spotter training classes all throughout the state of Kansas that let folks know uh, what to look for. It's just really good educational information, even if you don't want to be an official storm spotter calling in your reports to emergency officials or meteorologists. It's still a good idea to have your family informed so you can be prepared. All around Topeka, we have been looking forward to the 70th anniversary of the Brown versus Board of Education ruling. It is coming up in May, and activities have already been in full swing. That includes some special exhibits at the Topeka and Shawnee County Public Library. David was able to welcome Brittany Keegan and Michael Cates to find out more about them. Tell me about this special exhibit that's coming up. I know it's uh, going to be really dynamic, and it's uh, our stories African-American Topeka before and after Brown and sorting out our race. Tell me about what we're going to see over there, Brittany. Sure. Well, it's it's a exhibit that was put together really to look at the communities uh, and the neighborhoods in Topeka that uh, were, have been here for so long and uh, pivotal in, in shaping the city as well. Um, Michael has worked with uh, the Black Collective for many years and they uh, put together this exhibit, and this is something that uh, he, he should share that information, but the library was so excited about the idea and really being the place that when uh, people come to their library to see that local history as well. Yeah, Michael, it sounds like a culmination of a lot of years of hard work. Yeah, so the Black Collective formed several years ago with this mindset that we really wanted to tell our stories from our perspective. Mm -hmm. And so this exhibition really looks at uh, Topeka African American history going all the way back to the Underground Railroad to the enslavement period. Uh, then, of course, we also look at the Exodusters. So in this exhibition, you're going to see the Exodusters. You're also going to see the different neighborhoods. A lot of people don't know there were at least uh, five to six African American neighborhoods. So, you, of course, you had the Bottoms, you had Tennessee Town, you had Mud Town. Uh, you had uh, Pierce Edition. So you're gonna be able to actually explore those towns and actually look at the people that came before Brown v. Ward. Mm -hmm. And that really paved the way. And so this is something that we really wanted to talk about and make sure people understood that there were people uh, that were really focused on making sure there was integration here in Topeka well before Brown v. Ward. And of course, afterward, when they began to really um, cement and make sure that uh, equality was here in Topeka. And it's really an important part of our city's history, one that perhaps there's a generation living here now that really doesn't know much about this because they did, they weren't alive during that time or haven't studied it necessarily in school yet. So it's important for us to help keep that history alive. Yeah, since the exhibit's opened on Friday, we've already witnessed some great conversations between family members, grandparents bringing grandkids in, parents and, and their children uh, about the history and about what they remember and, and how it resonates with them. Yeah. What do you think in terms of that as far as keeping that history alive and making sure that we continue to tell the story to other generations? So as a teacher, um, one of the things that 501 does, one of the things that Topeka School does, we really try to make sure our students understand uh, the diff different ethnic histories here in Topeka and across the United States. And so I think it's really important to be able to make sure our students understand this really rich history. And we're really excited to be able to share uh, with my students. And I want to just say hi to my Robinson Middle School students, and I know that they'll see this and they'll yeah. say something tomorrow. We've got some pictures that are a part of the exhibit we can show our viewers right now. This one right here. Uh, can you tell us what we're looking at here? Yeah, that's the Apex Gallery. That was one of the, so here in Topeka, there was segregation um, where African Americans only could only go to um, the African American designated um, 
theater. And so um, this is a picture of some school kids uh, hanging out in front of the Apex Theater. Uh, the Apex Theater was one of those hub places where um, they would have community events, uh, people would come together, and have, they would have really just a good time. And of course, this was also a period where you had pictures and silent films that were taking place. And so it was a really good time for the uh, black community here in Topeka to really re relax. So fortunate that we still have these, these relics of history here. Now, what is this picture we're seeing? Of course, you, th in this picture, you're seeing some school children who are attending I'm not sure exactly sure which school this is. It might be. Um, this is uh, Dr. Sheldon's kindergarten. Yep, Dr. Yeah, Sheldon. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you're right. Yep. So you're this right. is Dr. Sheldon, and of course, Dr. Sheldon was very instrument, instrumental in uh, Tennessee Town, mm -hmm. and so this is some of the students that would have uh, been attending that school in Tennessee Town. Here's another picture of Nick Childs. Tell me about Nick Childs and his history. Nick Childs was an entrepreneur. Uh, he owned the Plain Dealer newspaper. He owned several. He owned a hotel here in Topeka, Kansas. He was an entrepreneur. Uh, he was really w the one that cultivated uh, w what I call Black Wall Street here in Topeka. And uh, he was someone who really believed in um, making sure African Americans supported one another. And his legacy is still continuing with a number of different people and things that we see in our community even today. Yeah, I got about 20 seconds here, Brittany. Just again, you all are very happy, I'm sure, to host this exhibit. Yeah, we're great. Uh, so happy about it as being the local library where people come in to visit and can see this exhibit as well. There it is right there. And for information, folks, our stories, African American Topeka before and after Brown. It's open now, runs through May 19th in the Alice Sabatini Gallery at the Topeka and Shawnee County Public Library. Uh, and it's sorting out race as well, examining racial identity and stereotypes. That's in thrift store donations, open Sunday, March 3rd, and runs through May 19th, also in the library's Sabatini Gallery. Uh, Brittany and Michael, thanks for being here and thanks thank for letting you. us know. And I'm sure you're going to get a lot of folks coming by to check things out. Well, thank you. We're excited about it. Okay, thanks and have a good thank rest you. of your day. Thank those exhibits are very powerful, as is the Brown versus Board National Historic Park located in Topeka at the former Monroe Elementary School. So absolutely check those out, especially as we mark the milestone of 70 years since the Brown v. Board anniversary. Capper Foundation's Dialogue Coffee House has special activities that they launched a month ago to celebrate the abilities all of us have. They call it Abilities Day. Their second one is just around the corner, and they're planning a very special event with the Topeka Zoo coming up in April. Chelsea Houston spoke with David about that. Chelsea, good to see you as you always. Too, yeah. So Abilities Day, this is put on by Dialogue and the Capper Foundation. Mm -hmm. We report regularly on these events and they're yeah. always a wonderful situation where folks come out and learn about other folks in our community. Exactly. Tell me about next week's event. Yeah, so uh, at Dialogue, we just realized that a lot of our employees only see each other when they're at Dialogue. Mm -hmm. So then we began to think a little broader on how many other individuals in our community don't get to see their friends um, or meet new people. And so we really wanted to create an event that was a safe and inclusive environment for our friends with disabilities. And so we came up with the idea of Abilities Day and just creating an atmosphere of fun and camaraderie where uh, everyone with disabilities, their peers, can just come together and, and have a good time. And you've got the three dialogue locations over 29th yeah. Engaged, Fellowship Bible Church, out in Silver Lake, huh? but these events happen at Fellowship Bible Church. Yes. We're going to show you some video of the event we had just a few weeks ago yeah. here where you had some Topeka police officers out there. Y'all were playing bingo. It was yeah. a great time. Yeah. And so tell me what's going to happen next week. So we actually had so much fun at bingo. We're going to do it again. Okay. <laughs> um, I had I talked about changing it up and uh, there was there was not there was resistance. Yes, there was. There was pushback. Yeah, okay. so uh, we are going to have the, the Topeka Police Department back. We're also going to have the Sheriff's Office. They're going to send some officers out as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then we really, we want this to be a, a time for our friends and peers of all abilities. So everyone is welcome to come to, uh, to, to it. Yeah, and this is again, we're going to tell you in a moment, it's coming up next week on March 4th. But Remind our viewers as well the dialogue concept, what it's all about, and, yeah. and how you've had this growth as well over the yeah. last couple of years. Yeah, so Dialogue Coffee House, uh, we are actually hitting our fifth year um, in April, April 18th. It is now going to be officially Dialogue Day um, for the city of Topeka. Uh, the mayor is going to be uh, making that announcement on April 18th. That's awesome. So we're very excited about that. And uh, the whole point of, of Dialogue Day is really just to uh, showcase what dialogue is, which is um, an opportunity to start that dialogue mm -hmm. about 
everyone with abilities of all kinds. Yeah, we're, we're all the same. We're all in yep, it together. Exactly. And you're going to have a great time next yeah. week. Let's let our viewers see the graphic information for this. It's coming up next week, Abilities Day at Dialogue Coffee House, 9 to 11 a.m. March 4th. And really, it's the first Monday of every month. And again, it's at the Fellowship Bible Church location of Dialogue, which is 6800 Southwest 10th Avenue. You can, uh, uh, Abilities Day at the Zoo is also coming up. Save the date on this one is April 22nd. Tell me about that real fast. Yeah, so we are partnering with the Topeka Zoo, and instead of doing it in FBC inside, we're going to open it up. We're going to do um, some fun uh, learning opportunities. Um, they might, we might do a feeding or two with mm -hmm. some different animals. Just a time to kind of uh, get a little broader. Have two amazing nonprofits in town work together on um, on this fun event. Yeah, so our viewers can come out next week on the fourth yeah, and get some course. coffee. Yep. Melissa always tells me about the snacks you have. Um, What's up with this? Is it cookies? Our cookies are phenomenal. Okay. So she's, <laughs> she raves about the cookies. They're so, so good. Yes. Yeah. Yep. What makes them so good? Uh, that's the dialogue secret. I'm, well, okay. <laughs> now I'm intrigued. Now I'm, now I'm cookie intrigued yes. again. This is coming up next week. It's Abilities Day over at Dialogue Inside Fellowship Bible Church. Chelsea, it's always good to see you. Yes, and you thank as well. you all for doing thank what you. you do. And I know our community supports all the work that you all do as well. Thank you. Okay. We'll if you know someone who would enjoy Abilities Day or if you'd like to enjoy Abilities Day or just grab a good cup of coffee, visit one of the Dialogue coffee houses around Topeka. You will not be sorry, especially if you grab a monster cookie while you're there. Personal favorites. Gotta love it. There's another great breakfast that is coming up. This one is the Breakfast for Hope. The second year for this event, it benefits Vallejo Behavioral Health. Amy Cop hasty joined me in the studio to announce that tickets are on sale, and we also found out who their special guest speaker will be this year. It's the second year. We can call it annual now. Yes, we can. Welcome. Thank you for having me on today. What a beautiful day to be here. Oh, it's always a beautiful day. Always a beautiful day <laughs> when you are here with your bright, smiling face and Vallejo is here to help our community. What is the Breakfast for Hope? What do you all have planned for the day? Well, first, before I forget, I want to thank Stormont Vale Health because for the second year in a row, they have provided the funding for this event. So big shout out of thanks to them. Um, this is our second year, and in addition to having a wonderful keynote speaker, which we can talk about here in a minute, I want to say we're honoring you for all <laughs> of your amazing work in the mental health arena because you help us get the word out so much and spread the word about the importance of mental health, and we just appreciate you so much, Melissa. Well, it is a group effort, so I share that with all of us at WIBW-TV for doing that. The Hear Me, See Me project is part of that, raising awareness for mental health. But this is important for what Vallejo does in the community. What does an event like this allow you to do? Well, it allows us to fund unmet needs. So, for example, we've been on here many times uh, in the last two years talking about the Mobile Access Partnership. That is a program with a pop-up shower and hot food and clothing. Um, and all kinds of, you know, shoes and clothing and supplies for the unsheltered. And that is not something that is in our budget. We do not have a budget for that. There was a need for it. We saw the need and with our community partners, we rose up to meet that need. So an event like this helps us with programs like that. It's a vital, vital program. It's been so well received yes. and so much demand for it. I am interested to hear from your keynote speaker because it is Kendall Gammon, who was a player for the Kansas City Chiefs. He now hosts one of the pregame shows. How does he relate to an event like this? Well, it's, it's very uh, interesting um, that we were able to get him for the breakfast. We actually initially reached out to him for our annual Unmasking Stigma fundraiser, which is in the fall, mm -hmm. which you've always been a part of, but he just was not in our budget and after we had to say well I'm sorry we had to move on to someone else we just couldn't afford you Kendall um, he just very much uh, wanted to be part of our efforts because he so strongly believes in the importance of mental health he's had his own mental health struggles in his life um, through his um, football career which was very expansive he was in a Super Bowl he mm -hmm. played in a Super Bowl and he didn't I don't think they won that year, but um, <laughs> anyway, um, so he has some personal stories to tell about his own mental health journey and why it's important. And um, he was able to do this at a price that we could afford. So we're very thankful. Because of his own generosity. Yes, so he's yes. kind of giving, giving back and paying it forward. When someone of that kind of a stature, a pro football player, a professional athlete, someone who's known in the community is willing to share your story, how important is that to really helping to shine a light on the importance of mental health? 
Well, it's so important because mental health, there's so much stigma that surrounds mental health. And it's something that, you know, people learn through their culture or through sometimes through religion, um, through the environment that they grow up in, that it's just not okay to talk about mental health issues. And so when you have someone stand up that was a you know professional football player and say, hey, I experience that, I can relate to that, it opens the door for other people to be able to say safely, oh, I experienced that too, or oh, oh my goodness, you, you experienced that? Well, that's what I'm experiencing. Mm -hmm. So it's very powerful. Well, how can people hear from Kendall Gammon and support Vallejo at the Breakfast for Hope? Well, tickets are on sale, they're $60, um, and we do have reserved seating for a table of eight. Um, that is a different price. It is Friday, uh, May 3rd at the Beacon from eight to nine. We purposely keep it an hour so everybody can get back to work. <laughs> and uh, tickets are on sale through Give Butter. And I knew I wouldn't remember it, Melissa. So. GiveButter.com slash Vallejo Breakfast. And I'm gonna have the direct link online as well. But tickets just went on sale and we've just announced Kendall yes. Gammon as your featured speaker. So I'm excited. Hope you can join us for the Breakfast for Hope. Vallejo's work is so very important in our community. And as I mentioned, if you need any resources, go to wibw.com slash hear me, see me. A lot of information is on that special web page that we have created here at WIBW Television. I have a bonus segment for you today. This is just such a powerful story. I want to share it with you here. I do a weekly medical segment. You can see it Thursdays on 13 News at 10. We call it To Your Health. You can also find it on the health page of wibw.com. Our story this week had to do with surviving a stroke. We were contacted. They told us we have this great patient testimonial. And it's because that this particular patient is someone who he says himself he should have known better and he did everything wrong. So now he is speaking out so that we all can learn from him. Take a listen. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Darren Johnson is grateful to be making up for lost time. I don't remember anything a whole month of lost time. It started on a drive home from visiting his wife's family in Arizona. She noticed he wasn't right and asked if they should stop. He wanted to keep going. We got home real late at night. The next morning when she tried to wake me up, I was not real coherent. Darren is an assistant shift supervisor for Douglas County 911, earning honors for helping save lives. How many calls over the years do you think you have answered? from people suffering strokes? Stroke alone, probably a thousand. Yet you didn't recognize, over the years. Yet you didn't recognize the signs in yourself. Exactly. Darren was put on a gurney to go into the ambulance November 14th. It's the last thing he remembers until waking up in Stormont Vale Hospital December 16th. When I first woke up, I couldn't raise my arm above my chest. Right side was total. Uh, I could barely get it off the ground. Three times, he says, his oxygen dropped so low he nearly died. But within weeks, he was strong enough to start therapy at Kansas Rehabilitation Hospital. Woohoo! Good job, dear. Soon he was standing and starting to walk again. I'm able to walk, you know, longer distances now than I was able to. My arm, you know, I use a walker. Uh, if we're going longer distances, I'll use the wheelchair. <laughs> Darren's working on his strength and memory so he can one day return to work. Until he can help people on the other end of a call, he's helping by sharing his story. Listen to what's going on. You know, if, if it doesn't feel right, get help, get checked. Make sure you're okay. Listen, because minutes matter. Darren knows a delay like his doesn't usually end like this. I feel totally blessed. I, I, I am, I feel like a miracle because... I should not have been here. I should not have survived this. Oh, well, you're doing, girl. So what are those signs you should be looking for? Just remember the acronym FAST. Think fast. If your face, or maybe you notice this on someone else, if the face is kind of drooping on one side, if one arm is weak, say you hold both your arms in front of you and one of them kind of drifts down, if your speech is slurred or you have difficulty being understood, then it is T, time to call 911. As you heard from Darren, time makes all the difference between how you may be able to recover 
if at all. Something to take very seriously, folks. So we're glad you're with us today on the podcast to hear that message. Remember, if you want to see the video from any of our guests that are on Ion Northeast Kansas, go to WIBW.com. I also post them on our YouTube channel. Just search WIBW 13 News. Click subscribe while you are there if you would like. And our studio selfies along with the segment links are on my Facebook page, WIBW Melissa Bruner. Glad you could give us a listen. Until next time, we'll see you on the Red Couch.